So with no further ado, um, I guess I should also introduce myself. My name is Etta King. I'm the Education Program Manager here at the Jewish Women's Archive. Our Education Program Assistant, Miriam Canterstone, is also joining us today um, and helping to field some of the questions. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And as we're going, feel free to type questions, ideas, observations in the chat, and also use that to talk with one another. That's what it's there for. So just first a word about the Jewish Women's Archive. So JWA's mission is to document Jewish women's stories, elevate their voices, and inspire them to be agents of change. Um, and to do that work, educators are, are essential partners who are really working in the field to catalyze uh, Jewish education and bring rich and inclusive history of Jewish life in America to students of all ages and all genders. So it, our mission is related to uh, women and their stories, but we recognize that that work happens um, with people, all different kinds of people, not just women, and that these stories are important for all of us to learn. Um, and one of our uh, former employees used to say, students cannot be what they cannot see. Uh, and so our education work is really about giving students a variety of historical role models that really represent the breadth of people and experience in the Jewish community and allows students to imagine and build an inclusive Jewish future. Um, and we root all of our pedagogy in the exploration of primary sources and personal narrative as a main way for students to grapple with those questions. Um, explore their own identities to learn about the experience of women and to be aware of when uh, there are certain stories or parts of the story that might be missing in their communities. Um, also one more thing to say before we jump into the content which is that uh, we have a wonderful opportunity for educators who are working with middle school and high school students whether you're in youth group, supplemental school, um, day school, whatever um, called the Natalia Tversky Educator Award. Um, so in order to apply for the award, you need to develop a, a, a sort of original lesson plan, something that you've written yourself, not necessarily something that you've taken from our site, that incorporates the stories of American Jewish women um, in primary source documents. And uh, the reason that I want to make sure to highlight it, one is the deadline is coming up sort of towards the end of the semester on May 12th. Um, but also because two of the past Tversky Award winners, Judy Sandman, who was last year's winner, and Allison Matana, who was the uh, 2012 winner, um, both of them used the, some of the materials that we're going to be talking about today uh, to teach their lessons, and they put their own spin on it. So Judy Sandman uh, brought in some contemporary texts also about the recent factory collapse in Bangladesh and the garment workers there. Um, and Allison used um, some profiles of Jewish women labor leaders and compared the way that they made change and did their activism to the characters of Esther and Vashti from the Purim story. So two really creative ways of bringing in um, the lessons, uh, the labor material and the primary sources from this collection. So just keep that in mind in the back of your head as we're going through this, because I think it's a good way to get those creative juices flowing. And I always like to lay out sort of the goals of the program. So we're really going to be looking at the experiences of Jewish women garment workers um, and looking at the role that Jewish women played in organizing. So this is a, a part of the American Jewish story that is really clear. Jewish women played a huge part in um, labor rights organizing, especially at the turn of the century. Uh, and also looking at a couple different um, tools or ways of exploring primary source documents that you can take into your classroom. Um, so this lesson comes from our social justice education project called Living the Legacy, uh, which has 24 lessons in it, 16 on Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement and another eight uh, that focus on the labor movement. The first few lessons in the labor movement module um, really focus on the activism in, the, in New York on behalf of or by Jewish immigrant women. 
um, and then sort of built out from that to the changing role of Jews from laborers to um, allies of laborers and uh, other exploited peoples. There's a great lesson on Jewish agricultural labor. Uh, there's a lesson that's fascinating about consumer organizing and boycotts and how consumers can use their power to um, get what they want. And the last lesson focuses on contemporary labor issues, looking um, in the agricultural labor piece, we bring in something about the Amokali tomato pickers. And in the contemporary labor lesson, um, there's some text about the domestic workers bill of rights and looking at people who are working in the home. So really interesting stuff there. And today we're gonna really focus on the early, the historical stories from the early part of uh, the 20th century. So with no further ado, we're gonna jump right in and I'm gonna model two different ways of doing a document study with photos. So we have a broad understanding of what Jewish text is at the Jewish Women's Archive and photos are one of those Jewish texts that we like to use. So we're gonna start just by taking a look at this photo. I know it's kind of small and hard to see. Um, if I blow it up bigger, it just gets pixelated. So um, I'm sorry if it's hard for you to see, but we'll sort of trudge through. And I just want to start by having you all take a look at this picture and then write into the chat um, listing things that you, you notice about the picture. So I'll give you a minute to do that. Um, and these are just observations that you're making. That there's nothing too big or too small. Yep, so Harriet's saying it's very cramped and messy. There's clutter everywhere. What else? Look in the foreground, in the background. Um, are there any observations or um, inferences you can draw about what these people are doing, what it might feel like, smell like, sound like? Looks like a man and a woman working it, um, not in a factory environment, but they're definitely working on something. Yeah, so I'm gonna pull out my pointer here as you guys are drawing. So there's some stuff piled here. It looks like it could perhaps be on a sewing machine. This definitely looks like a sewing table. Um, another thing that I like to highlight is that it's blurry here. So there's really a lot of movement. This is not a still picture it, and it's not a posed picture. Um, what else do you see? Got a few people typing in here. So Harriet's asking a question. What's that hanging on the wall up here? It looks like a handbag. Yeah, it looks like a handbag to me too. Um, it's sort of an interesting thing to be held out of this mess, right, and hot, hung high on the wall above everything. So looking at some of the windows, we've got windows here and here, maybe they could be broken. Um, something else I think that is especially hard to see here is there are some people here at the back, so it's hard to see, but this is somebody's face. So this is a pretty long room full of stuff and it just goes back. Um, and now, I, Harriet already posed one question of what is this thing on the wall. What other questions do you have about this picture? What else would you want to know from looking at this picture? So when was it taken? How much do these people get paid? I assume it's by the piece. That's a great question. Um, so as you guys, as you all are typing in, I'm just gonna answer some of these questions. Um, so this is actually taken around 1900. This is a photo that we um, took from the Kiel Center collection at Cornell University. Um, and Harriet brings up an important um, 
an important observation about a lot of garment work, especially early garment work um, at, and garment at work at this time, um, which is that you get paid by the piece that you make. So this is actually a really small factory. Um, it's not even, not even really what we know as a factory setting, but this is somebody's apartment and they're doing garment work in their apartment. Um, and there may be some people who live in the apartment who work there and other people who just come in for the day and are working. And they are, they're, they're creating things by the piece and either selling them to other producers or selling them directly to small retailers. Um, some other questions about how much they get paid, where they are, um, what the workday hours are. Those are questions I don't have the answer to about these specific things, though the um, background essay for this lesson has some more information about that and there's a lot of information on our site and on the Keel Center site that you can use to give students more background. So one great way to interact with the picture is to start by having students make some observations and ask some questions and then from there you can decide how you want to move on. Are you going to give them the information in the lecture? Are you going to have them do some research of their own? Um, you can send them on to jwa.org and that's a great place to find some of this information. Um, are they going to do some activities and learn about it that way? So um, the picture can be the entry point into sort of the broader or deeper learning. Um, now I want to show you a slightly different way of doing a photo study. We're going to look at a second photograph. Um, and this one actually has a matching worksheet in the lesson plan. We call this activity fact, feeling, idea, question. Um, yeah, Harriet's also mentioning that the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in New York has an apartment devoted to this work, and they have some great online resources as well. Thanks for pointing that out. I'll make sure that we include that link in the resources on the um, webinar recording page. So Miriam's going to post a link in the chat to an online workspace we have called a Lino board. And um, go ahead and click on that link, and um, it'll take you to this Lino board. And what you'll see is um, this photograph that I've posted and four sticky notes, one in each corner, that say fact, feeling, idea, and question. And so what I'd like you to do is using the color respective post-it notes, post something that you see, a fact about this picture, something that you observe, a feeling that you have from looking at it, an idea that it gives you, and a question. And you might not get to all four, so post to the ones that come most readily to you, but sort of teasing out all of the different information or connections that we can get from this picture. Um, so you can do this as a on a worksheet, or you could also do it up on the board or a piece of butcher paper, and this is the we're going to use this sort of different workspace. So go ahead and post some things there. And if you want to see what other people have posted, you can refresh the board. So some facts coming in about uh, sort of the different roles that people are playing. So the men are standing up and the women, <clears throat> many of the women are sitting and working. Um, they look well dressed. And this is something that comes up a lot in these pictures, um, that a lot of people are well dressed and do look well dressed, and also that the kind of dress from this time period is different. So teasing some of those fashion-related observations out I think is good. Um, not many people have posted a feeling yet, but one of the feelings that I get from this is, um, that has come up also in some other studies is this feeling of, uh, sort of not really being able to tell how the women are feeling, um, and not being sure about if it's hard work or easy and, and how they're feeling in the situation. Um, if you're having trouble see, seeing the sticky notes that people are posting, try refreshing your web page. 
and um, when you refresh, it should show you the other notes that people have posted. So someone saying it looks staged, maybe um, showing conditions better than they really were in reality. That's great. And a question, do these people take pride in their work? So great. So I'm, I'm going to leave this line out up and you're welcome to keep posting. We'll post the link to this also on the webinar recording page. Um, and if any of the technology isn't working for you, you can always post in the chat. Um, I see Miriam, it looks like you're having some trouble with the lino, that's fine. So feel free to use the chat at any and all points along the road here. So, um, you know, there are some students who learn better by writing and also we're asking them for slightly different things when we're doing this activity, especially getting to feeling or making, drawing some inferences of what it might feel like or sound like, how the workers might feel, what their experiences might be. And this lesson really uses, um, uses this activity to get students to start thinking in the mindset of these workers before we go and read some primary source documents. So a few more feelings I just wanna hold up that people are writing in. So the workers are very focused on their work. They're not interacting with each other. Um, and it seems like people aren't really talking to each other that everyone's just sort of looking down and, and doing their work. That's great. So um, feel free to keep that lino pulled up. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here um, and just talk for a second about the next activity in the lesson plan, which we're not actually going to do because uh, I wanted to save time for us to get explore the documents. But um, to move on to this activity, basically you have students create a line uh, across the classroom, a, a continuum of agree, disagree and then read out these statements. Um, I won't read them out loud, but we have eight or nine here. Um, and asking students to explain a little bit about why they've chosen a specific point on the continuum. And this activity is to build off of the photographs and really get students to think about work, the meaning of work, um, power that people have as individuals or working together as a group. Um, so there's some questions here also about um, who's capable of social action and making change, and also about um, why people do do work um, and why people might maybe be dissatisfied with their work, which is what we get to in the document studies. So now, sorry, now we're going to look at some document studies, which are excerpts from Pauline Newman's memoir. And I just want to tell you a few things about uh, Pauline Newman. So she was born sometime in the 1890s. Uh, that exact information was lost when she was when she emigrated here, but um, she was born in Lithuania. She came here at a, a pretty early age and immediately went to work, um, working in factories. And she worked um, in the, she started to work in the Triangle factory um, when she was about 11, working in the kindergarten, which is, was a corner of the factory where uh, young children cut loose threads off of the ends of um, the different pieces of the waste that they were sewing. And um, as she was working in the factory, um, Pauline Newman was also studying literature, Yiddish literature and English literature. She uh, loved poetry and writing and um, that brought in inspired her rather to share that with her colleagues and the people that she was working with in the factory and in organizing some classes literature classes she that brought her to union organizing um, when she was just about 16 years old she led the largest rent strike in new york until that time um, which i think is a really powerful piece for those of you who are working with teens to to really show what uh, power teenagers have and what community coalitions can do even if people are young or just you know one person one worker um, and it's also I think important to mention that uh, Newman was a um, 
a trailblazer also in her personal life. So she had a long, lifelong partnership with a woman named Frida Miller. The two of them raised an adopted daughter together. Um, and even though lesbian relationships and families weren't really talked about in this openly in this time period, um, both of them did a lot of work with unions and government organizing and in the community and people, their colleagues in unions and in the government tended, seem to accept their relationship. I think it's really important, just like it's important to highlight the stories of women, to um, present our students with examples of queer role models. And I think Pauline Newman is a really great example from an, an earlier period in American history. Um, and she was a lifelong activist for labor rights and dedicated her life to doing um, work in the labor movement until she passed away, I think, in 1986. So now what we're going to do is we're going to read some excerpts from her memoir, and I'm going to pull up uh, the discussion or the document study here. And I'd like you all just to read it looks like a big chunk of test text here, but um, just read through this first page. So don't worry, you should be able to scroll on your own. Um, and don't worry too much uh, yet about the second page, but go ahead and read through the first page here. I'll give you a minute or two to do that, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. And when you're done reading the text, um, I'd love for you all to answer these two questions. One is, um, what were reasons why, um, why these workers may have wanted to strike or organize to change the working conditions? And what were some reasons why they might not want to do that? So sort of the arguments for and against uh, union organizing and organizing to change your work conditions. And Marilyn's writing in also saying so much of this can apply to today. We're going to get to that part, Marilyn. <laughs> So I think a really important part of doing text study, especially looking at historical texts, is having students pull out particular pieces of evidence that help us understand one perspective or another. So here we're looking at um, why might people want to change what, what that experience was and why might they not want to do that. Nice. Great. So a few people writing in. Marilyn saying, um, striking for better conditions, more for their family. Um, but there was also a risk that you could lose your job, which meant you lost your income. Um, and saying, I'm sure there were others who would take their place. So yeah, something about this period in history is there were sort of a steady stream of immigrants coming to look for work. And that made it risky to be a troublemaker. Absolutely. Yeah. So Michael writing in saying, 
no privacy, no security, no dignity. So thinking about um, Rose Schneiderman, who's another activist from this time, has this quote that says, the workers must have bread, but they must have roses too. So thinking about um, working was not just about money, but it was about sort of your sense of pride, um, the community that you had, the sense of fulfillment that you could get, that there's other reasons that people work and other things that money gives us besides the necessities. And so thinking about how all of that is tied up in this struggle, I think is great. A few more people are writing in and then we're gonna um, move on. And also feel free to highlight uh, if there are any other reasons why people might not wanna organize um, or would. I just wanna make sure that we get to capture the different voices of people who are typing in. Um, and then I think another, a few other things that ha haven't um, come up yet are, so we talked about not having income to pay for food or rent or heat at that time. Remember this is in New York City, so that's important. Um, and also that there were some real physical repercussions that could happen um, if, if you were striking or if um, people perceived you as a threat, they might um, harass you in the workplace. Yeah, and some other reasons, so fighting for a voice in their workplace, improving um, conditions that they faced, Pay was deducted if you were late. Um, there were some risks that you could be judged for being disruptive. Yeah, all of this is great. So I'm gonna hide this. We're gonna come back to this in a second. Uh, but first, what I wanna do is give you some information about um, the uprising of the 20,000. And this is a really pivotal story in the story of the labor movement. And I think it's especially important in the Jewish story um, because the American labor movement was really shaped by the activism of immigrant workers and there were few immigrant groups who played as prominent a role as Jewish American women um, and immigrant women. So that I think is a really fantastic part of this story that's right there. It's right there on the surface. It's not something that we have to go looking for. So. It's important to note that the uprising of the 20,000 wasn't a sort of spontaneous moment uh, of collaboration. It grew out of years of striking and organizing and um, specifically organizing women and bringing them into the movement, cultivating them as movement leaders um, and building momentum. And the sort of big movement, or sorry, big union at the time was the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, the ILGWU. Uh, this is a picture of the local 25. Um, and so this was a union of people working in all of the ladies garment trades. So waist makers who were making the shirts, um, dress makers, cloak makers, hat makers, all of the people who were making women's clothing. Um, and there's one organizer in, in particular that we're going to talk about a little bit in this part called Clara Lemlich. Um, she's this person who's in the circle. And, um, and the ILGWU worked closely, especially in organizing around the uprising of the 20,000, which the, with the National Women's Trade Union League, the WTUL, which was a, a coalition between working class and upper class women. Um, it was similar to partnership that we see between um, whites and blacks during the civil rights movement. It's something that's sort of created out of necessity because when upper class women got involved, when they joined working class women on the picket lines and were beaten up by thugs or harassed by scabs, um, the media paid attention to them. They also brought social connections and money resources to the struggle. And so they were sort of able to lend their social and political power to uh, the plight of the workers. Um, so all of this is building and, and there's a lot of unrest in the factories. Workers are really, really uh, uh, angry and upset about the conditions that they're facing. And so on November 22nd, they all gather at Cooper Union. And different leaders um, 
Samuel Gompers from the American Federation of Labor, Mary Dreyer, who is heading up the Women's Trade Union League, um, are speaking in sort of general terms and they're they're trying to keep the crowd from moving to this sort of radical strike idea. Um, and that's when Clara Lemlich, who is around 20, 21 years old at the time, stands up and says, listen, she's in Yiddish, she says, um, what, we, what we're here to decide is whether we shall or shall not strike. I am a worker like you. I'm one of those who's suffering from the abuses that we're talking about. And I move that we go on a general strike, which is a strike of all of the different locals and all people who are working in all the different industries within the ILGWU, everyone strikes regardless of the factory that you're in. And so um, the, the way the story goes is the crowd sort of cheers and they, they take a yo an oath in Yiddish that says, if, if I break the strike, may, my, may I lose my hand sort of with the, if I forget the Jerusalem in that same vein, which is like a very clear Jewish thread that runs through this story. Um, and, and they start a general strike. And the strike is long, it lasts 11 weeks. It's going through the winter. So it starts in November and it moves through into, uh, through the winter, the sort of hardest part of winter. Um, and at the end of that time, it, it was a long strike. The workers, I think, gave in before they uh, had won all of the things that they were advocating for. But in some factories, they were able to negotiate um, a shorter work week, paid holidays, um, not being charged for the tools and um, materials, thread and needles and things like that, that they were working with, um, and some rights for union organizing. Um, and at the end of the strike, a another really important piece of the story is that 85% of the shirtwaist makers in New York had joined the ILGWU. Um, and the local 25 had grown from 100 members to 10, more than 10,000. So this strike was important, not just for the wins, but I think even in larger part for really catalyzing the garment uh, unions and the ILGWU in, in, in particular and sort of get, getting some real power behind it. Um, and that this was a really a win for women. It, proved that women workers could be organized and wanted to take on leadership, that they were a powerful force to be reckoned with. Um, and it sort of kicked off several years of strikes that turned the garment industry into one of the best organized industries in the country. So um, now we're just going to look briefly at a second excerpt of Pauline Newman's memoir. Um, so I'm going to pull this back up that looks, talk, where she talks a little bit just about what it's like to organize. Um, so there's two short excerpts here. So that's, this is the second page of the um, document study here. So go ahead and read this and then just make some observations about, especially about sort of the feeling and motivation that she's talking about. So Marilyn's um, calling out this idea of uh, Newman's acknowledgement that women aren't getting credit for their work in the movement. So I think that's a really important piece to pull out here, especially given that we know women were leading the movement. I think it's especially important to notice the tone, um, the tone with which she's talking about organizing and associating that with sort of the feelings of both hope and struggle that union members and strikers were feeling at this time. Um, and that Marilyn's also saying, you know, that uh, just because they
they didn't get credit didn't mean that they weren't going to fight and that they weren't going to take those leadership positions. A couple other people are writing in here before we move on. So Michael's writing in saying, it, it's reminding me of the beginning of Exodus. Without strong women like Shifra and Pua, uh, Miriam, Pharaoh's daughter, there wouldn't be a Moses. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent connection to make. In fact, we have that text about Shifra and Pua, who are the, the midwives in the Passover story. We have that text related to some of the materials in Living the Legacy. I think that's an excellent parallel to draw. Um, and Passover's coming up soon, so there's something, maybe some connection to be had there. Um, and highlighting that there are major risks that you have to take in order to make important change. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thinking about sort of the individual and collective sacrifices that need to be made in order for there to be collective good. Um, great. So um, Marilyn's asking a question that's a nice segue, I think, into this next little part. So I'm going to go ahead and hide this text study for now. We'll make sure that we send these things to you, but she's asking, if there were ways they could pool their resources to help them get through the strikes. So that's one more, I think, important thing to say about union organizing, which is that unions didn't just provide the organizing piece, but they also um, provided social services. So that's emergency food relief, rent money, and help, um, money to pay your heat for families who were striking. Um, it was English and cultural enrichment classes, providing entertainment, um, granting loans from the community to individuals or to families. Um, Susan is also saying, and bail money, which is, you know, at, during this strike, hundreds of people were arrested. So the union paid bail for those people and gave them legal representation, which is important. Um, and this picture comes from a union uh, summer camp. This is a group of people who uh, were workers. They they were taken out of the city to come to this camp for a little while, and this is them uh, about to listen to a, a psychology lecture. So the union provided a great number of services that uh, bolstered people's membership and, and desire and motivation to be involved. So um, I want to move us on to the next part of the story. So this is in 1909. The, uh, up, the uprising of the 20,000 happens. There are some big wins in some of the factories. It's a huge win for the ILGWU and sort of women's labor organizing. Um, and then two years later in March of 1911 is the Triangle Waste Factory fire. So I, I know from your comments that several of you are familiar with this story. We have a lot of information about this on the site. There are tons of resources that are that were created a few years ago for the 100th anniversary of the fire. So there's lots of ways for you to learn about this online. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it right now. Um, but uh, it's important to note that in the agreements that were signed after the uprising of the 20,000, the Triangle Factory was one of the factories that had actually not signed on to those agreements. So that's an important part of the Triangle story. Um, and remember, the Triangle is where Pauline Newman was working. And, that's the woman whose memoir we've been reading. Um, this is a picture of several workers from the Triangle factory with the owners. Max Blank, who's this man in the suit standing with his hands in front of him, um, and Isaac Harris, who's to the right, sort of standing sideways. And it's important to note that um, both Max Blank and Isaac Harris were Jews. So while many of the people that were employed by the Triangle uh, were Jewish, so were the workers or the owners who were the people who were actively exploiting the workers and working, doing everything that they could to avoid making concessions to the union. This is a really important piece to highlight in the story. Um, and in general, when we're talking about Jewish activism, we're talking about the involvement of Jews in social justice movements to look for both sides of that story because Jews fall on both sides and complicating that narrative a little bit and thinking about how we own our responsibility, whether we are employers or consumers, 
um, and thinking about how we can move towards creating a more just world in the roles of uh, employer or consumer and not just in the role of worker. Um, so this was on March 25th. Um, it was a Saturday. Uh, it happened, um, the fire broke out sort of mid-afternoon. It was a, a beautiful day. There was a Washington Square Park is across the street from the building where the factory was. Um, there are people out picnicking and probably what happened is someone lit a match for a cigarette uh, and um, it accidentally caught some of the fabric on fire and uh, the factory quickly uh, sort of went up in flames. The emergency exits were closed because uh, the owners were trying to keep people from stealing material or stealing time by taking breaks um, and trying to keep out union organizers. So that's a really direct parallel to some of the other things that we've been talking about. Um, and it says 148 here. Um, most records say 146 women uh, and some men, but mostly Jewish and Italian immigrant women died in the fire or from jumping from the windows. And this was obviously very, very tragic story, something that union members and, and the people watching were just horrified by. It could have been prevented. Um, and I think another great reason, I like to use this particular primary source, this newspaper, one, because some of the pictures of the fire are really quite graphic. And I think sometimes that can be upsetting. Um, but also you'll notice that this is a picture or a newspaper from uh, Oklahoma. So this made national news headlines. I mean, it was a big deal. And um, the fire really started to catalyze some action uh, and pick up some of the momentum that had been started in 1909 and then was sort of building with some of these other smaller strikes that were going on. So the, after the fire, the Women's Trade Union League, remember it's that coalition organization that we had talked about, um, had a meeting and the leaders were calling to put pressure on civic leadership. Um, and Rose Schneiderman, who's another Jewish organizer, um, stands up in a very similar tone to uh, Clara Lemlich and said, you know, she spoke directly to the workers in the crowd and she said, I'm sick and tired of other people waiting for other people to work on our behalf. We should stand up and take action for ourselves. This is our problem and we are the ones that can fix it. Um, and there's a great lesson plan about this. Miriam put the link in the chat. So in addition to the lesson plan that we're focusing on here, there's a whole other lesson plan in our Go and Learn resources, specifically about this speech that um, Schneiderman gave after the Triangle Fire. And it's a really, really great lesson. And there's um, resources for uh, sort of middle and high school students, family, education, and adults. There are lesson plans for all three of those around this speech that she gave. Um, and so 500,000 people show up to a funeral uh, for seven victims of the fire who were unidentified. I mean, a huge amount of people. Um, and the sort of public attention to this and the general outcry, uh, both from unions and from the citizens of New York, led to the establishment of the New York State Committee on Safety, um, which began to create and implement uh, workplace safety laws, many of which we benefit from today, including laws about fire safety and emergency exits, um, child labor laws, and this event really catalyzed the foundation of the laws that are still in place um, that provide for the sort of safety and rights of workers. Um, so, and I see Harriet sharing a, a story about her own connection to the triangle here, which is great. Um, I wanna move on because there's a, there are a few other pieces to touch on here. So at this point in the lesson plan that's in Living the Legacy, um, there's an activity where students can write their personal work manif manifestos. And it's sort of a way for students to take what they've learned and then think about their own um, individual work goals, how those goals might relate to a larger community, um, in how their work might relate to other people's work, and um, I think it's important to note that our students 
sort of concept and understanding of work is going to be heavily informed by their class experience. Um, and it might be quite different than the workers that they're um, reading about. But this is a way to sort of start drawing out those personal connections and sort of thinking about this big idea of work. Um, I think that this could also be a potentially challenging exercise if you're not going to be building upon it in any way. Uh, so people who are doing this as a standalone activity, you might find that this particular activity within the lesson plan isn't as relevant to you. But I think it's also great if you're building on um, building towards a community action project, if you're doing some service learning, using this mission statement, guiding principles, and intention format to have your students think about the work that they're doing and their relationships to other people um, can be a great way to sort of segue into uh, those other applications for thinking critically about work and about collective action. Um, so this is just an example that we created to go with the curriculum. Um, but I do want to show you one other way of building off of this material that's been quite popular. I know Susan and Marilyn, who are on the call today, have definitely done some work with this. I'm sure um, Michael also has uh, in some respects, which is to take this historical story and bring it into a contemporary context. So one really popular way to do that is talking about the garment industry in other countries. Um, most recently stories coming out of Bangladesh with the huge factory collapse that was there. I think there are some amazing resources online, some that have been linked to on this lesson, the lesson plan page. Um, so there are lots of examples of that. When I first started putting together this lesson, it was sort of right after uh, holiday time. And um, I found this really interesting article about Amazon warehouses. So I chose a slightly different contemporary text about labor that I want us to look at now and just spend the last 10 minutes or so thinking about um, the similarities and differences between this labor story and the historical labor stories that we've been exploring. So let me pull this up for you. Okay. So go ahead and um, read through this. this. These are some excerpts from a, a pretty long um, blog article expose that was written by Mac McLeland. And I wrote out a couple questions here that I think it would be good for us to at least start with. Um, one I, is just thinking about how is this similar or similar to or different from the other texts that we looked at today. So Marilyn writing in, um, similar as to the control the employer takes, regulating how long the work takes to get done and expectations that there's enough time to do the work that's expected. Um, Michael again writing in, no privacy, no security, no dignity. Um, yeah, and actually, the way that I would uh, present or with the way that you could present this article to students is not to give them the title um, and sort of give them just the text and ask them some questions about how it's similar, how it's different, maybe asking when and where they think the author is working and 
sort of what time period. Um, and then giving them some more information about uh, uh, where this is coming from. Any other points we want to um, raise up or questions you have about this text before we talk a little bit more about how you might use it? Okay. So I'm going to hide this. Um, I think another great parallel to uh, this text is that there are some pictures available online, um, people who have done exposés of Amazon warehouses. So this is a panoramic picture where you can really see how huge this place is. Um, this, this is of an Amazon warehouse in Phoenix, which is 1.2 million square feet. And these are people who are being you know, paid to work uh, 10 or 12 or 15 hour shifts during peak times to walk around, walk around and collect items from these warehouses. Um, so incorporating a photo study and doing some of the activities that we had talked about at the beginning of this session. Um, and then I think there are some questions to be had about sort of the role we play as consumers um, and the implications of that and our responsibility as Jews. So I'd love to sort of kick this last question um, about whether or not American Jews are responsible for protecting workers' rights today. Um, I want to open that up to you all and uh, also move on to any sort of questions and ideas that you might have about how to use this information in your classes, how you could play with these ideas in your communities. What else is sort of percolating for you all? I see a couple people are writing in here. And does it I guess also asking, make sure that if anyone has any questions about the contemporary text or the historical things that we've been talking about, now is the time to ask those. Great, so I see that um, Marilyn is uh, holding up this question about, I think my students would not see this as a Jewish issue as opposed to an issue for all or sort of a, a human issue. What do you all think about that? I, I know that this is a question that's raised a lot in our sessions, um, talking about whether or not social justice can or should be specifically a Jewish issue. Yeah, and trying to think about maybe some of you all have some ideas to make a stronger Jewish tie. We got a bunch of people typing in. That's one of the hard things about chat is it takes a, a little while to have the conversation. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so 
suggesting that compassion for all human beings is a core value for every community uh, and that Jewish labor leaders work for the betterment of all workers. So yeah, I think these are really important um, pieces to draw out. And um, Michael's writing in saying, there's a great text from the Babylonian Talmud, uh, Tractate Erevin 65b, a person makes their character known in three ways, how they drink, how they spend, and how they express anger. Um, so this piece about how they spend their money, and I think there's a great way to connect that to, you know, who has bought something from Amazon, and what does that mean? Um, there's a great connection to be made there. I like this idea that we're teasing out about, um, you know, if the Jewish piece is important, and Brittany's holding up the idea that uh, children and teens would be proud to learn that these types of human issues are connected to Jewish history. So that's certainly true for some communities. The Jewish piece is sort of the historical legacy or connection. Um, yeah, you know, I think Marilyn responding by saying it feels maybe to them too tribal. You know, I think that's a big question. I think that's also something that gener newer generations of Jews are really grappling with in terms of understanding where the Jewish community fits in sort of the global community. Uh, and certainly something that's heightened by our awareness of how our um, lives as Jews and Americans sort of play into global and international consumer issues and sort of international human rights issues. It's not a, it's not an easy question. So um, it's here, 159, where I think it's, uh, I think we're going to wrap up this conversation, but I really appreciate everyone taking the time to come today. We will send you emails with links to the recording and also to a bunch of resources here. Um, Miriam is going to post the link to the National Educators Network in the chat. Um, the Facebook group is a great place for you to continue these conversations and sort of hash out these ideas, especially this question of, uh, is it important to tell the Jewish story? Why is it important? Um, and how do we do that in a way that feels authentic and relevant to our students? Um, so I really hope that we can continue this conversation. And uh, I hope that this has been a uh, worthwhile activity for you on this afternoon. Um, and uh, there's also, I should say one last thing, which is that there's going to be a survey. So please give us some feedback in the survey. We're starting to think towards next year's online learning programs and how we can continue to make these better. So your feedback is really important. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, don't miss this second text that Michael has put in the chat. I'll make sure that I put links to those texts on the uh, webinar page. And um, I hope to see you all at a future online learning program. Be well, and for those of you on the East Coast, stay warm. <laughs>